The DFS Studio is brought to you by DraftKings. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast with your hosts, Kyle Borgannoni and Matthew Betts. Yo, 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 we're back. It's Tuesday, November 7th on the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I am joined, as always, by Matthew just staring right back at me, Bets. That is how this works. <laughs> you are correct about that. When we talk into this uh, you know, microphone and computer together. Uh, man, we're on to week 10, which is just wild. We're officially halfway through the NFL season. How are you feeling about uh, the 2023 season as a whole so far? So, you know, there's a, lots of different buckets that I can organize my thoughts in for the people in an audio format. I wish I visually I could show you, but you know, Bets and I, you know, we talk about our season long props. We go through the summer of best ball, which <laughs> next summer, just, just write it down your schedule. Just, just put it down that in May we start the conversation for best ball. So I have that you know, I have my main two home leagues, my dynasty leagues that I'm in, DF. I mean, it's just all of those buckets. But I will have to say that what I have felt best about this year is I've, I feel like I've kind of figured out a zone for building cash lineups. That sounds great because I'm terrible at cash this year. I might not even play the rest of the year, dude. Uh, just donating to our friends at DraftKings. On a weekly basis at this point, um, you had a good good week in cash, I know. I did not. Uh, I ended up spending up for Jalen Hurts and dropped down to B. John Robinson. And I thought I disliked Arthur Smith a lot. Now I really, really dislike Arthur Smith because you would think, Kyle, in a game without Drake London, that your best players touch the ball a little more often than they used to. But no, let's run Jonu Smith on a sweep from the one yard line and see what happens. So um, yeah, man, it was a bad week for me and cash, but Hey, we had some fun building a tournament lineup together. Yeah, we did pretty well. Bets and I decided we would just go in on a single entry tournament. So we built a lineup together, which is something you could do. Um, it was just, Hey, it's just me and him went back and forth and we uh, had a pretty good return in our investment for a single entry tournament. As a Falcons fan, I just want to tell the people out there, it doesn't bother me. I'm just completely, you know, used to it. I'm numb and it doesn't really matter. I had this stat that I threw out there yesterday that this year between the three first round picks, Drake London, B. John Robinson, Kyle Pitts, they've touched the ball on 35% of the Falcons plays. Now, what that doesn't really tell is that, you know, targets that are off and, you know, they didn't actually touch the ball. But the point is this team doesn't really, you know, think about us. They don't think about DFS. They don't think about any of that stuff. So, uh, I just kind of mostly stayed away from my Falcons for my emotional health. But with cash building, I think this is what listeners of our podcast, and we'll get to share some you know people that had a good week, very good week in DFS. I think we're starting to get a feel of this is how the slate could go. And this is my opportunity cost if I fade certain players. Like That's one of the things I feel like I want to give people as a takeaway. It's not just building lineups, looking at projections. It's getting a feel for... This is what could happen. Here's how we can gain leverage on the field. Here's what's good chalk. Here's what's bad chalk. You know, if like we said all week, Bets, you were very clear about this. Like you should play Pop Douglas in cash. Do not play him in tournaments. And yet I was still seeing lineups saying like, oh, what do you think about this tournament build? So do you think that's the part though that is kind of missing from a lot of processes? Not just here's my lineup, but like how did you arrive here and what is the field going to do? Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is just trying to figure out what our opponents are going to going to do and figuring out if we think that's right or wrong. And, you know, like you said, that's just a good example is Pop Douglas. And it's actually true, I think, of a lot of cheap wide receivers that end up being popular is are they just being thrust into roster percentage because of their salary and projected opportunity? And if that's the case, oftentimes those guys will fail more more likely than not, or at least just not bury you like he was good for cash, right? 10 points or whatever it was, but that's not going to win you a tournament, uh, especially at where he was rostered. So trying to figure out specific examples like that of like, if this player fails, how do I capitalize? 
Um, if you dip your toes into like the three K range and drop down and just change your salary structure a little bit at wide receiver, uh, Noah Brown, <laughs> you know, broke the slate uh, as an example. Um, and, and same thing too at the top with Alvin Kamara. Like we talked about, he projected pretty well. I thought he was a really good play in cash. But you had said, you know, look if if he's eighty one hundred and he fails, and someone like CD Lamb or AJ Brown just goes bonkers, it's tough to fit those guys together. So that's a way that you can say, I'm going to leverage the field here and get different. But yeah, I think thinking about that, you know, in that context is if, if this player fails, what happens? And we need to be able to kind of do that in tournaments to figure out how to jump the leaderboard and, uh, and win some big money. So that's, that's kind of what I think about. All right, let's talk about those cash lineups. Straight cash, homie. I think the biggest dilemma of this past week in cash was what to do at running back because it felt like a three running back type of slate. Alvin Kamara, uh, Saquon Barkley, and Jacobs were kind of our top dudes that if you wanted to approach this slate, you needed to figure out like, how am I going to fit in at least one of those guys? I like Jacobs the most and he was my number one running back. So I was really fortunate that he got the end zone twice, almost got to 100 yards. But Kamara felt like one of those players that if you faded him, you were terrified, like just because of how awesome he's been. So I went back and forth on that. I landed on Kamara, although you were probably annoyed at me because I went like three different layers of like bets. I don't want to play Kamara. I don't, I'm worried about this. I want to play Chris Olave. I'm really selfish and stubborn and you got to, you know, get the brunt of that. But the other running back plays that really smashed were Rashad White and Ramondre Stevenson, which were lower on our list, but they were in our, you know, in the guys that we mentioned. So I didn't land there, but I feel like if you had one of those players, then you did well. It was more of, did you have Devin Singletary? And over half the field did. Uh, I did too, but I don't think he's what sunk a lot of people. No, we we talked about that. It's like, this guy is probably the worst tournament play on the slate, just given the context of, you know, the Ross percentage he'll come with and a terrible matchup against Vita Bay and the Bucks. And we talked about, you know, they're going to need to throw against Tampa. That's what teams do. Um, shout out to CJ Stroud for an incredible performance. He looks incredible as do the uh, pass catchers he's playing with. But um, yeah, I thought he was a terrible tournament play. I thought he was awesome in cash because cheap running back volume is really what helps unlock things for the top of your lineup. If you wanted to play uh, Hertz over Dak, or if you wanted to play CD or Amon Ra, or excuse me, uh, uh, AJ Brown over Adam Thielen, like those kind of things help move those puzzle pieces around for you to get up to the studs. So I thought he was totally fine in cash. I ended up landing on, like I said, Bijan um, and coming down from Jacobs to get up to Jalen Hurts, which uh, certainly, no pun intended, hurts <laughs> with the outcome that happened there. Uh, but it was a, an interesting slate, man. I actually had a lot more fun playing uh, tournaments this week. I didn't play a ton of cash just because I thought it was one of those weeks where the chalk was so fragile and I knew everyone was going to play it that I wanted to get different elsewhere. So I had a pretty decent week GPP wise, uh, was fortunate to land on one CJ Stroud lineup. However, it was paired with uh, Jerome Ford and Bijan Robinson. So it didn't do anything. And then I had a, a dart throw late on Michael Gallup over Noah Brown, which really just, <laughs> just <laughs> hurt. So it, it was like a min cash didn't actually mean much at all, but uh, I felt good about going back to Stroud after I was on him last week. I felt good that Dak was the player that I think most of our listeners had them had in their lineups and Dak smashed. Um, I was fortunate to have CD Lamb and I, and CD Lamb was somebody that just I just couldn't move off of the matchup. So uh, I had a good week in cash, not a great week in tournaments, but it was nice to see the pool of players that we arrived at in our best plays made sense. And it kind of just it was a couple of different plays like the the players that went off right and especially the early slate were like Kate Otten who was in our dart throws by the way uh Dalton Schultz it was you know Cole Komet it was like all these tight ends that like weren't gonna bury you so if you're one of those players you're like my team's not scoring any points nobody's team was scoring that many points in the early window and so really what it mattered is in the afternoon how did you approach Dallas and Philadelphia did you have Josh Jacobs or Saquon Barkley? Did you have, you know, what other pieces? So think about that. Think about the late window, late swap, um, and where the chalk is going to be. So for me, I was behind the cash line going in the afternoon, but I still had Dak, 
still had CeeDee Lamb, still had Josh Jacobs. So I knew that there was kind of that afternoon hammer. And I feel like that's been the case recently. Like I'm on my hot streak. Last year, you had a streak of like, I don't know, like eight weeks in a row where you just couldn't miss. This year, I, I, I've i been, you know, pretty much since I got back from the beach, man, I've been living life in cash. And it's been the afternoon window, that afternoon hammer where I'm like, okay, I'm behind, but I have four players and I think they can carry me through. So that's kind of been my story. And it's stressful, but it's also nice just to lean into teams that have good team applied totals. So what you're saying is if you're struggling this year in DFS, go touch some sand, a little salt water, come back and all will be well. I feel like I have new perspective. I'm a new man. (laughs) I just just sitting there staring off into the ocean thinking about DFS. I, okay, so my best moments this year in DFS have been when I'm outside for real and I'm thinking about it like the week before was when I moved off Tony Pollard. Um, this past week was like, I got, I just, I don't think Kamara is the play. So I faded Kamara in tournaments, complete fade, didn't play him anywhere. Um, still don't have a great week, but like the read on the slate feels like, okay, here's what I have to gain. So those are the kind of conversations you get to have with yourself when you're outside. I, I, I want us to be contemplative people. You know, I feel like that's the kind of crew we have. Oh, definitely. Very fancy. Speaking of the kind of people. Money, 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 money. I want to read off a couple of different Discord winners. Uh, we got an email from Nikki Lang. She said, I turned $3 into a first place finish. Won over $250. Thank you, DFS Pass. Uh, this one's from Entertain This, which is a podcast says, I just want to say thanks for the Noah Brown dart throw. Suggestion helped me triple my cash. And my friend won 10K in a tournament. So um, that's pretty good. And I'll let you read this one from Danimal313 on Discord. Yeah, it says, I've been listening to uh, Borg and Bet since the beginning and have grabbed the DFS pass and always getting close, but never breaking out. This week, I finally had a Kool-Aid man week. 2.5x uh, on my money and won my first tournament. Thanks, gents, for the great entertainment. And now the payout to match. It's a pretty good feeling to walk with some people. He says he also won the uh, Ballers tournament, which I already reserved my spot and I'm calling it. This is the week where I take that down. I used to have a lot of success in our Ballers tournament at ballersdfs.com. Hasn't been the case in a while. I feel like I've been on a cold streak in those leagues. Yeah, I, I haven't seen your name at the top of the leaderboards recently, but to be fair. <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> That's like such like a nice way of saying. I haven't really seen you around the top of around anything. Like n- no one's been mentioning your name. <laughs> no one's talking about you anymore, Kyle. It's uh, it's rough out there. But if you want to get all of our picks, you can get them at dfspass.com. Hey, use the promo code DFSPOD. Save some money and you get all of our picks from DraftKings, FanDuel, our optimizer, which slowly throughout the week, I, I want to stress this. If you're an optimizer, if you're an opto bro or gal, Wait, just slow. The, the optimizer is not going to give you very much information on a Tuesday. I don't even look at it on a Wednesday. Eh, it's going to start, but I don't really look at the optimizer till like Thursday or Friday when I can start getting a read. And it doesn't give you, you know, for a main slate, it doesn't give you the information for roster percentages that are clear until probably Saturday. Like, is that something that you'd emphasize to people? Because I, I have people all the time says like, the optimizer said this on Wednesday. It's like, dude, we, we don't even have our full projections in. Bets and I haven't even made our picks yet. Like, we haven't even written the articles yet. So it's really hard to get a read. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm never going to talk bad about someone that loves DFS and fantasy football at that level. But don't build lineups on a Wednesday. <laughs> like, like, there's a reason, uh, you know, the slate locks on Sunday. Um, it's funny. We get a lot of support emails and stuff like that about, like, optimizers not working the projections aren't something's wrong you know it's like guys we have five days to football like we gotta we gotta pump the brakes here so yes uh give it a a few days give it a few uh you know days to get acclimated get the information and follow injury reports practice status stuff like that because projections change literally all the way until sunday morning yeah and you know the starting quarterback this past week was one of those perfect examples we had a ton of backups And we had ones that changed, like we got Deshaun Watson news on Friday, like, oh, he's going to start. Well, that's going to change the outlook of that entire team and the projections and the roster percentage. And it's also think about this. One player's roster percentage at the quarterback position also changes the roster percentages of all the other quarterbacks. 
that are available. It's like, oh, well, here's a value. Like, So keep that in mind. Go slow, but uh, stay involved on Discord and go to DFSPass.com to hang out with us. State of the Main Slate. Each week, Bets and I refer to the lines at DraftKings Sportsbook. It's where Bets and I play. So go to sportsbook.draftkings.com. And we're going to check in with some wagers before we talk about the Week 10 lines. Bets, you have a live, and I mean it is a live bet right now, for uh, your boy Joseph Burrow, who's always been my favorite player. We know that. Yes, you've been on him since day one. <laughs> since Actually, since he was at Ohio State way back in the day. You were a huge fan. Um, yeah, I grabbed him last week. I thought just on that Sunday night game, you know, it's like, man, prime time against Josh Allen. Everyone's talking about this game. Huge ramifications in the playoff picture. Uh, I'm going to grab Burrow plus uh, 2200 MVP. And if they win this game, like there's no doubt his odds will improve. He's now up to seven to one, uh, which is fourth right behind Lamar, Jalen Hurts and Pat Mahomes at the top. Tua then is at uh, plus 650 and then Burrow at, like I said, plus 700. And ironically, <laughs> I wanted to give this little shout out. Christian McCaffrey, according to the the books here, has a better chance at his odds to win MVP than Josh Allen currently on, on DK. So I thought that was funny. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see Burrow move in the right direction. And even like uh, you mentioned J- Jalen Hurts four weeks ago, something like that. You mentioned like, I think he's a value. He'll move up if the Eagles keep winning, uh, which they do. So Hopefully you guys grabbed some of these values about a month ago. Yeah, MVP, I feel like this year is a lot more fluid than it's been in the past, but you really don't get to see a favorite until about, I don't know, week 12, week 13, where things start to really change. Like, you know, I hate to say it, but likely somebody will get injured. Like there will be a team that they get, you know, just one of those guys, that's what happens. A team has a bad stretch. You've seen that with Josh Allen, so he's kind of moved back. And... Then the odds are going to change, you know, where it's minus 150, minus 200. I love betting MVP and sprinkle throughout the year to get some really good odds. Like you mentioned, Joe Burrow, uh, Jalen Hurts. Lamar Jackson doesn't have the counting stats, but the team is record-wise is good enough. If he kind of goes off, he's an interesting kind of late um, value, I think. But keep this Oh, he's, mark he's the mind. favorite right now. He's tied with, with Hurts and Mahomes. Really? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Fifty, dude. Because I have some from before the year that are looking. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> I wish everyone could have seen Kyle's face. He just got so happy and so excited. I haven't that looked was, at it this week, so I didn't know. That was the most genuine reaction <laughs> of all time. Yeah, dude, he's tied with with Hurts and Mahomes at the top, uh, which the Ravens are just rolling right now. So uh, it makes sense. But yeah, man, he's plus uh, plus three fifty at the top. Jeez, that's wild to me because, like the the overall numbers aren't close to what Lamar put up in his MVP season. Like he hasn't, he didn't throw for a touchdown this past week. He is leading the league in completion percentage. So it's a narrative award. There's a lot more to it. Wins, all those things. So, wow, that makes me feel really good. I can just log out. Should we end the podcast now? <laughs> yep, we're done. See you, See you on Friday. <laughs> all right, I'll check in with a wager that uh, is turning in the right direction. Probably three weeks ago on this podcast, in this exact segment, we talked about some teams and some win totals. I put out an article of some teams that are trending in the right direction. Um, and I liked the Bills under at the time. I did not see them, one, losing to the Patriots. And then they just lost again to the Bengals. So Bengals under, I believe we had it at, was it 10 and a half wins? Yeah, 10 and a half. I think it was plus 125. Yeah. So it, it's definitely trending in the right direction. It's it's weird to see the Bills because you you feel like this team should be a lot better. But I feel like they're one like playmaker on offense short. It's like weird looking at this team and they're inefficient in the running game. They Josh Allen, like Whoa, 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 dude. They they fixed the issue. They signed Leonard Fournette. Lenny I he signed the contract, but he showed up and he was like, I don't know if I really want to be here. It's a lot colder <laughs> than I thought. Yeah, that was pretty funny, actually. <laughs> so uh Bill's under and then uh Eagles over was another one that that we took um, or earlier. So that's, that's trending in the right direction. So once again, these are markets that are not just stuck. You kind of can see if there's any inefficiency and sprinkle a little bit as you go. We're going to take a quick break and move on to week 10. This episode is brought to you by FX's Fargo, a thrilling new chapter starring Juno Temple, John Hamm, and Jennifer Jason Leigh, 
is, uh, well, it's on the way. And the Emmy award-winning series from creator Noah Hawley has been called one of the most consistently great shows of the past decade. And guess what? I had a chance to screen it. I saw the first episode for the new season, and um, I, I'll be honest with you, it was absolutely incredible from start to finish. Uh, I am excited to see how this season unfolds, and I would recommend it to all of my friends. It was like a, a movie from start to finish, Incredible acting. I loved it. FX's Fargo premieres November 21st on FX. Stream it on Hulu. All right, bets. We're going to look at the lines for this week in the main slate, which is 10 games, so not very big. We also have a Germany game this week that is off the slate. And what's interesting is the bye week teams this week, we're going to feel it. We're going to feel that the Eagles, Chiefs, Dolphins, and Rams are teams that we've talked about a ton, we've stacked a ton, and they're just not on the slate. So you're going to feel it at some level of the teams that we've trusted a ton, but give me the teams with the highest team implied totals because we don't have any game that's hitting 50. Yeah, for sure. And the highest scoring environment right now looks like it'll be Lions at Chargers, which is at 48 and a half. Uh, but yeah, there's no games above 50, as has been the case, what feels like every every week. Uh, and by the way, your stat continues to hit. We had the under in that Sunday night game. I think the total closed at 50 and a half. The under hit again. And then in Germany, it was Dolphins and Chiefs, which I think was at 51, if it closed correctly, if I remember, also hit the under. So your auto fire on the under <laughs> on the under 50s just continues to hit, it's, which is uh, wild. But It's science. You know? Yeah. 87% of the time it works every time uh on this slate the top five team implied totals Dallas <laughs> taking on the Giants oh, oh 11 and a half point t- team total for the Giants is just so bad they are 16 point favorites so we've got the Cowboys leading the way the Bengals at 26.8 the Seahawks at 25.8 the Lions at 25 and the Niners at 24 the John Gi- I mean like so, so people like when I put together this for the show every week, I put together the team applied totals that, you know, I try to update it right before a recording and the Giants total had dropped. And so their team applied total, like Beds mentioned, is 11 and a half. I've been doing this with you for five years now. Is that the lowest that you've seen? I think so, dude. That is just wild to look at. Yeah, it feels like something from 1930, 1940. And what's crazy, I looked this up, I was like, okay, so 11 and a half is super low. It's actually higher than what they've averaged this year. They've averaged 11.2 points per game this year. So uh, I feel bad, man. I mean, it's just, if you could have pictured a season going horribly, I don't think you could have even pictured this for the Giants. Not this bad. Now That's what I mean. I So Jason, Jason got a lot of Giants hate because over the Austin, Jason was like, that team is fraudulent. They're not good. And yes, they've dealt with injuries, but man, they were super fortunate last year. They're really easy fade in a lot of places this year. So uh, yeah, I feel bad. I'm sorry, Giants fans, but you're just going to get slaughtered this week as a 16 point road favorite against the Cowboys. So that's interesting. You mentioned earlier, the most popular game is probably going to be Detroit at the Chargers. You and I are notorious Chargers supporters. I personally may not be the biggest Lions supporter over the years, but this is going to be a fun game, right? This is, I mean, this is the one that if you're going to focus on one, this is it. Yeah, probably. Uh, It's got the highest total. It's being played in a dome. You've got two teams where you pretty much know where the football is going, especially on the Chargers side, given the injuries that they're dealing with, with Mike Williams and Josh Palmer. It's like, man, you play Eckler and you play Keenan, and on the other side, you know, it's Amon Ra and the running backs and, and Sam Laporta. So it's very clear kind of where the football goes, makes it very easy to stack. So I could see this one being quite popular, uh, given the reasons I just mentioned. Yeah. And the running game for Detroit is going to be a tough conversation this week with David Montgomery coming back. Like, can you play Gibbs? Like, can you play a game script where you're going, you know, golf and you're stacking that side and you play Eckler and you use Gibbs as part of that because he's. He's a pass catcher. There's just lots of different routes. So I'm excited to talk about that game later in the week because I think you can get different, but Keenan's expensive, man. Like, I love Keenan Allen. He's expensive. Amon Ra is a great play. He's expensive as well. And outside of that, like on the Chargers side, it's like, who else do you play other than Eckler? 
it's it's really 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 hard so um it'll be a fun game to go through i put on here houston at cincinnati the total's at 46 and a half it's fine but i think people will chase cj stroud and rightfully so he just had the greatest rookie game of all time for fantasy and joe mixon we'll talk about him in salary standouts he is going to be a very popular play this week and for good reason like his price i feel like they just forgot about him and forgot about the matchup on DraftKings. So Houston at Cincinnati, Detroit at the Chargers. Those are the top for over-under, and I think people are going to play it. Which game do you think will be the sneakiest this week? Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go back to Seattle this week. It was pretty rough. It sucked, Against man. Baltimore. I mean, uh, maybe Baltimore is just that good. They, make, they made the Lions look terrible. They made the Seahawks look terrible. Uh, but... Now they go home, they get a bounce back spot here against Washington, and really what it has come down to for Geno this year, he's been like one of the most pressure-sensitive quarterbacks in the league. Fortunately, Washington, of course, at the trade deadline, uh, got rid of Montez Sweat and Chase Young, so they're not likely to rush the passer with success. Last week against Mac Jones, the commanders had zero sacks and one quarterback hit, so if Geno gets a clean pocket... I think he can definitely get there this week. We'll talk about him in salary standouts, but his stacking partners are also pretty cheap. And then on the other side with Washington, we know the story and then they want to throw and they want to throw a lot. So it makes it very clear that you can bring it back with someone like Terry McLaurin or Johan Dotson, especially if Curtis Samuel is still out. Yeah, I'm going to double down with you and just say this game is worth attacking. It'll, it'll probably come in third, but both quarterbacks are under 6K on DraftKings. So you know, a double stack with Sam Howard, double stack with Geno Smith makes a lot of sense. I do want to throw out a sneaky play that your boy B-Rob, all right? I know you're a big Brian Robinson guy. You always have been, big supporter, loved him come out of Alabama as a fifth-year player. Just hit, it hits your model all over the place. <laughs> um, so Seattle's kind of been pretty leaky in the run game recently. They start off the year on, like, on fire. They were good against the run, but they're now 25th in schedule-adjusted fantasy points to running backs. In the last two weeks, Cleveland, and we saw Baltimore this past week, right? Like Baltimore imposed their will with Gus Edwards, Keaton Mitchell, Lamar ran for 60 yards. So I just think he's an interesting piece I want to bring up that if you're stacking that game, the passing attack is going to get all of the love where the running games, I think, are going to be great leverage points. And when we get to talk about these games on Friday, I want to see where there's roster percentage because I'm assuming right now, based on feel alone, based on vibes, Brian Robinson's looks like a player that's going to be played like in 4% of lineups. Probably. Yeah, probably he will be. Um, and I think it makes sense why the field wouldn't want to go there. He's been super He's game TD script dependent. dependent. Yeah. Oh, and, t- and touchdown. But last week coming off uh, the win against New England, 20 opportunities. But if you look at, you know, games that the commanders win versus lose, his splits are drastic. So he needs a lead or the game to stay close. And my concern is that they are now six and a half point underdogs. So contrarian play, sure. But um, it's sort of a tough sell for me, even though, like you said, he was one of my favorite players coming out of uh, Alabama. The game that I want to be <laughs> underweight on. You couldn't on, even say that with a straight face. I know. I could. Um, the game I want to be underweight on this week is Tennessee at Tampa Bay. Once again, it's really easy to chase what you saw last week with Tampa Bay and say, whoa, the game script called for Baker Mayfield to throw and for our boy K. Dot and the route running king to uh, to just be out there catching touchdowns. But that's probably not going to be a case against one of the slowest teams in the league, the Tennessee Titans. And Will Levis is just not ready for a back and forth type of game. It feels like a really slow slog. The over under is at, where are we at? 38 and a half. I just don't think it's a game you really need to go there with. And Rashad White is another player that people go, look what happened last week. It's it's just not my favorite. So I, I won't be playing a ton of Tennessee at Tampa Bay in tournaments. Uh, we'll talk about DeAndre Hopkins later because I think he's a, okay in cash. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to throw out uh, Jordan Love at Kenny Pickett as a game that just, call me crazy, Kyle, but doesn't scream upside. Uh, for the Packers, they are 26th in place per game. They have had four straight unders. The Steelers are 27th in plays per game. They've had six straight unders. Seven and one overall to the under this year are the Steelers. We've talked about that a bunch on the show. Just that's how they want to win, right? They want to win like 17 to 14 each game and just dominate with their defense and have Kenny Pickett just manage the game. So it does not look like a game environment that I will be getting into. 
Does it feel like, so these teams have been pretty gross this year in efficient football. It feels like they've played before. Like, I feel like we've seen this matchup and, and maybe it's because they've like played the Rams too, have been super inefficient recently. But I feel like these teams just kind of end up circling each other. You look at them on the slate and you go, well, that's, I'm not going there in tournaments. Like, I feel like we're getting feel a, like that. <laughs> I mean, same thing with like Tennessee and Tampa Bay. You're like, eh, it kind of feels like we've gotten this kind of game before. The team I'm most confident hitting the over of their team implied total. Let's just roll with the Cowboys. It's at 27 and a half, which is a lot, but they're averaging 27 and a half points per game this year. They've hit their team implied total in every single home game this year. So that's good. And since 2012, which is, this is a Kyle Borgannoni special people. All right. I don't, I don't throw out my last name a ton, but like, this is a Borgannoni special here. When we need to look up a stat, what has this team done historically? Betts knows all the time. He's like, all right, I know it sounds like something you would do. Since 2012, Betts, what if I told you that there have been 64 teams favored by more than two touchdowns at home, and they've averaged 30.2 points per game? Like, it just sounds like Dallas is going to be a team that we want. Yeah, they should roll. Uh, and you could see a ton of short fields. You could even see defensive touchdown in this game. So it makes a lot of sense. I can't argue it. I'm going to roll with Detroit. They're going to go over 25 points this week, taking on the Chargers. You have a big-time mismatch when it comes to rest. The Lions come out of their bye week. The Chargers go from the East Coast back to the West Coast after playing Monday Night Football. So that in and of itself does not lend well to the Chargers. As for Detroit, their offense, we know what they can do. Fourth in yards per play, fifth in first downs per game, 11th in EPA per play. And then defensively, the Chargers entering last night's game were 29th in EPA. So... I'm worried about the Chargers, man. We'll talk about them in a second, but I am on the Detroit side of this matchup. Yeah, I'm emotionally speaking, always worried about the Chargers, but I I think the line is just right. Like Detroit should be favored on the road when you factor in the rest and the way that this team wins, like with the offensive line running the ball. Uh, Will that translate to players, you know, going off? Like I can look at that offense and say, okay, I love the pieces. You know, I love them individually, but then you're like, what if, you know, Montgomery gets a touchdown, Laporta gets a touchdown, Gibbs gets a touchdown, and you look, and Amon Ra has like, you know, seven for 90. You look up, you're like, everyone was good. Was anybody great? That's what I'm always worried about with teams like that, where it's like, I want to lean in. And I think Laporta is a fine play this week. I think he's a good, um, he's expensive, but he's a good play as well. So I agree with you. I think Detroit is probably going to roll. I would take Detroit in the points right now. It's at one and a half. Yeah, I would too. All right, I'm going to give a contrarian take here. It would pain me to throw this out there, but the team I'm most confident hits their under, I'm going to throw out the 49ers, man. Their team implied total is 24 points. They're favored by three on the road against the Jaguars team that's been pretty good. San Fran's lost two straight. Both of these teams are just on the bye, so you can't give a rest you know, equation to this. And what if I told you that no team has surpassed 24 points. That's the team implied total against Jaguars this year. They're allowing the fourth lowest yards per carry allowed in the league. And these teams are bottom two in rush rate. So it's basically you're asking, is Brock Purdy going to be able to travel on the road and perform against the Jaguars? Like, And I, I, I have some doubts against that. So I just don't love San Fran this week. And McCaffrey is every week needs to be in the conversation. He's expensive for how bad of a matchup this is. So I won't be playing a ton of San Fran this week. Yeah, I'm interested to see what the field does with uh, Debo, who should be back. He was back at practice on Monday. So I think he's, I mean, he obviously is such a big part of their offense. They've also been missing left tackle Trent Williams quite a bit recently. So this outlook for me depends on those two guys, but I definitely see what you see what you mean. Jacksonville's been good, man, defensively. They've been really good, like you said. Um, I already mentioned I'm a little worried about the Chargers. I like the under on 23 and a half points for them this week. Uh, this team is missing Mike Williams, and I never thought I'd really say this, but they are missing Josh Palmer. Um, since week four, this team is averaging 23 points per game, but they're 20th in place per game, 20th in EPA, 31st in success rate. Uh, not good. And Detroit, like I said, gets that extra rest. Uh, the Chargers on a short week. And in that same kind of month-long sample before their bye week, Detroit was ninth in EPA per play defensively. So it doesn't feel like an awesome spot. And opponents this year are 5-3 and three to the under their team total against Detroit anyway. So 
Uh, like I said, this offense misses playmakers. They really need someone to step up. Quentin Johnston, uh, Jalen Guyton was just off PUP list, but he's you know still ramping up. They just need playmakers, and I'm I'm worried about the Chargers rest of the season. I'm worried as well. Like the the way you would get there in this game is like you get a ton of Justin Herbert volume. I'm talking like 45 plus pass attempts. The problem is Detroit loves to control the clock. They're pretty efficient. It's just, it's an environment where you can see the Chargers not get there. And I, I hate saying this too about Keenan Allen, but when Mike Williams went down, I had the exact opposite reaction. Uh, everyone's like, oh man, Keenan Allen's going to the moon. It's like, it's actually not good for him. And when Austin Eckler has returned, you've seen kind of those huge explosive games also not really be there. He's fine. He's great. He's consistent. But for DFS, I think you're not really seeing the ceiling that you want. But um, I think their passing game can get there. I just, they're they're another team like the Bills. They're one playmaker short. And if you don't have that, then you can kind of get exposed over time. So uh, let's move on to our salary standouts. Salary standouts. Last week, it was Dak week and Jalen Hurts. And those were the guys that we talked about pretty much the entire week. Who are you going to go with? I want to bring up Dak first this week because when you have a team that is favored by 16 points, you can easily run with a narrative. Just say, they're going to be up a ton. They're not going to need to throw. You could also reverse that and say, they got up a ton because they had touchdowns and they threw. It's like, there's always both of them. And you can look historically like I've done and see that teams that are favored by more than two touchdowns over the last decade, 71% of the time they threw for two touchdowns. So I think we would say Dak is, has a high floor this week. His ceiling can be in question if like, Hey, what if they just milk the clock and you know, they just win, I don't know, 30 to six and two of those touchdowns are on the ground get some field goals, he throws for one. That's totally a possibility. I do want to bring him up because at 6.7, that is very cheap for a player to have that type of team implied total, to have a 27 team implied total. And we've seen this team throw way more. So throwing out Dak first as a salary standout that you can use him, don't just shy away because they're up. uh, They're going to be up a ton. Yeah, we saw that exact scenario play out uh, two weeks ago against the Rams, right? He still was awesome. CD was awesome. Jake Ferguson was awesome uh, because they threw a ton in the first three quarters and they didn't have to, but he still got there. So um, that makes sense. I think he's going to be way under the radar this week because like you said, when you talk about running backs favored at home, huge team total, like I know it's in bad on Tony Pollard, but DK was ready for this. They were aggressive, putting him back up to 7.3, which come on, man. Tony Pollard has done nothing this year. And last week we got a huge discount. Now he's up, what, 900 bucks or 800 bucks, something like that. That's wild. Back to 7.3. But he'll project well because he always does. Um, so that that's an interesting leverage point, I think, uh, Dak versus the running game. But as far as quarterbacks, I still think Gino, even though it was terrible last week, you get a little discount here. It comes down 200 bucks to 5.8, taking on Washington and that's all we need to say to on Washington, which is just an awesome matchup at home, which we talked about earlier. So I am back in on Gino this week. I feel like Howell and Gino are going to be two very popular cash game quarterbacks for what they yes. say. Like I, and I like them both. Like I, I tried to pick like holes and saying, oh, well, don't go there. Like both of them will be elevated in their pass rate. We've seen that with Washington. Man, Seattle, the worst part about Seattle is they were in the most negative game script ever. I took the over on this podcast on Gino's past attempts and he didn't get there because they just stunk. Like it wasn't just like, Oh, this was, I, the game script was perfect and he couldn't get there because they weren't completing passes. I know. I looked at like the end of the third quarter. He had like 27 or something. I was like, Oh, okay. Like this, this is in the bag. No doubt. He's going to throw five more attempts in the fourth quarter. Through one. All of a sudden I was like, Oh, Oh, this is going to (laughs) lose. Like it was just complete stinker on the road. So, we're buying back in at home. What could go wrong? Yeah. Justin Herbert on FanDuel, I think, is a fine play at 8.5. We always talk about paying up for our quarterbacks on FanDuel. So um, passing volume, if you want to go there, he's at least interesting. But I would say Dak, Howell, and Geno are our favorites early in the week. Talk to us again later on. We'll have some other thoughts. But uh, at running back, you mentioned Tony Pollard. Do you 
is your early lean like I want a piece of the Cowboys and you know CeeDee Lamb's expensive you're not going to pay up for the defense in cash it, like is it like I want to play Dak or Pollard just to get a piece I think so uh, and like I said I just part of me is like what are they doing to us with the the price tag here on on Tony Pollard um still doesn't have a touchdown rushing this year but he did have one in the Eagles game got called back but still like there's a reason DraftKings is pricing him up and I can see the path especially if they're like you know what we need to get Tony going here like let's just force feed him and get him in the in the end zone uh, in an easy matchup I could see it so my lean is yes I want a cowboy in cash I don't know that I'll land on Pollard yet but he's gonna project like I said very well you heard it first bets one's a cowboy in cash is uh is the way that he put Yeehaw. it. Yeah. Uh Joe Mixon, I think like I, I my early lean is just like I want to play Joe Mixon this week at home against the Texans. 6.2. He, he's 7.7 on FanDuel, which is a very fair price. But 6.2 is egregious for a player that's getting his type of opportunities. Last week, he saw 20 opportunities week before 19. He's got a touchdown in back to back weeks. I like once again, should somebody be fired for this? Probably. Probably, yes. Um, and yeah, like you said, his role's just been so good. He's not always the most efficient runner, but I think he's looked a little better recently. Last week was kind of rough, but against the Niners, like he looked really good coming out of the bye week. And just with Burrow healthy, the offense in general looks so much better. So uh, yeah, he's way too cheap. And you know Mixon's going to get some base down work where he gets targets from Burrow. Especially, and we don't really talk about this, but... Uh, Jamar Chase is banged up dealing with the back injury. His status is up in the air this week. So certainly if you remove Jamar Chase from the situation, Joe Mixon looks even better. I, I'm going to say something that I don't know if you're going to like after what happened to you last week, but B. John Robinson is 6K. Nope. nope. Against the Arizona Cardinals, who are not good. Nope. Just it, it's, What's Tyler Algeo's price? I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> he is 2K. No, um, he is 4.7. Would I be shocked to Tyler Algier had more points than Bijan Robinson? No, we're not. It, it sucks because Falcon, like if you could play Falcons running back, okay, you would be very happy to do that, correct? Like uh, if maybe. that was just Might one position. Might as well position. just play Janu. Just play Janu at 3.6. He's their running back and tight end and wide receiver one. He's the goal hey, line guy. Smith. <laughs> uh, so those are the guys early in the week. Uh, we'll probably get some other values that pop up later on, but um, Rashad White is still only 5.8, and he's getting the opportunities. I mean, the touchdowns is what saved him. He wasn't efficient, but he's getting a lot of a lot of work in the passing game still. So he's someone I just have to mention, or I feel like I would be doing a disservice. Anybody else at running back you want to throw out? Uh, I don't think it's a great slate personally. Um, I only had a couple names in the dock, like you mentioned. So there's no one that like sticks out to me as, as just a slam dunk this week. Um, I mean, Travis Etienne's always going to project well because of his workload, tough matchup, but I think he's in play. I'm really interested to see what the field does. Like you said, with those lines running backs, because they're priced just right next to each other. Gibbs on on DraftKings at 7k Montgomery at 6.9. And I think it's going to be one of those situations where, you can't really play them in cash, but in tournaments, they're going to be really fun plays because when the field doesn't have a clear answer as to what to do, we sort of get stuck and we're like, ah, you know, I'll just I'll just pass on it. But it's a game environment we like. We talked about the Lions hitting their team implied total. So those guys are interested uh, for me in tournaments. Yeah, I, I just want to... The expensive guys, I can poke holes in all of them. Like McCaffrey, tough matchup on the road. Eckler is expensive against a good run defense. Um, Kamara is on the road against the Vikings, Saquon against the Cowboys. I Without think there's a quarterback. Yeah. Who are playing Danny DeVito. So I, I can see Eckler and Kamara being plays that I want to play in tournaments more, but, um, early in the week, it's like the six K range feels like the safer bet at wide receiver. We both have Amon Ra as like our first wide receiver off the board. It's like, I like the price mixed with what you know what they do well and what he's going to be needed to do against the Chargers so 8.3 I feel like Amon Ra's already like an early consider like he's in the pool already oh for sure we talked about the game environment you know just mentioned 
with the Lions liking that in the Dome. So it makes sense. If the passing game gets there, it, it goes through Amon Ra and Sam Laporta. That's pretty much it. And then because we talked about the Commanders and Seahawks being the game we want to attack, all of their wide receivers are in play. And it seems like DraftKings didn't move Jahan Dotson despite two really good games. Like his target share, his involvement the last three weeks has been really good. And he's only 5K. So do we know anything about Curtis Samuel? I've kind of forgotten that he exists. <laughs> it's very rude of you. Um, they haven't moved his price like at all recently, which is crazy. Like you Dotson? said, yeah. Um, and he was, I thought he was an awesome play last week. I played him in a couple tournaments just with Terry being so popular. It's like, yep. Oh, easy pivot. You just hope that it goes through Dotson. Um, not much news on McLaurin since it's only Tuesday, but like I said, he missed last week. He was a DNP all three Samuel. days. So it didn't, didn't sound like he was close. Yeah. Curtis Samuel. Okay. Yeah. He's, that's something to monitor because Seattle's been giving it up recently. Seattle wide receivers, you know, DK, a swing and a miss this past week for me. I uh, played him in tournaments and didn't go so well, but Washington has been one of those clear pass funnels you can throw against them. Um, JSN's still pretty cheap if you want to go there. But I, I like in this middle range, DeAndre Hopkins is 6K, and with Will Levis, the target share has just ballooned. So it, it's weird to like a player that's just old, but it's, I feel like he's going to be peppered with targets. And last week, you were on the Texans, because the matchup set against the Buccaneers you could throw. So I think Hopkins is fine at 6K. And then Tank Dell at 5.5 is another player that I'm interested in that range. So I feel like it's going to be paying up for a stud and then finding somebody in the 5K range. And then I don't love the pun options this week. Brandon Powell, his he's on the field for almost every single snap for the Vikings. His price has not moved. He also caught the touchdown that... Uh, beat the Falcons, so maybe that's why he's on my mind. But at 3.2, he's a punt option you can consider this week. Anybody else for you? Yeah, the punt options this week are not great at this point in time, but hopefully get more information with injuries, stuff like that. As the week goes on, they mentioned Christian Watson will be fine. He had the like back and chest injuries at the end of the game. He's always banged up this year. But if for some reason, which I don't think he will, but if for some reason he does sit, Jaden Reed is cheap at 3.8. You could put him in your pool. Um, Josh Reynolds is also 3.8. He could be part of a game stack, not for cash, I don't think, but a cheap, interesting way to get leverage uh, if you want to get exposure to Detroit and the Chargers. But outside of that, yeah, not too much for me. You're saying that the Lions were not really like all there with Jameson Williams yet? Because it, it feels like this team is saying out loud, like, this guy's never going to be ready. We're going to talk about him uh, actually on tomorrow's Dynasty show. So tune in. Yeah, I I mean, just bad news bears, man. Everywhere they acquired DPJ. Just just weird vibes there. A tight end, the doctor is 4.9. So Dalton Schultz was great this past week. He's been really good over the last month. And the Bengals are the best matchup schedule adjusted for tight ends in the NFL. So Dalton Schultz, I don't love the price. Like I don't, I hate paying in the 4K range. But in tournaments, he's going to be a player that you need to, to look at as a correlation piece. Joe Mixon, if you're game stacking. So that one's interesting. And then we both have Trey McBride on DraftKings at 3.5, on FanDuel at 5.1. If Kyler returns, I feel like Trey McBride feels like a like he's going to be the, the tight end this week. Yeah, he probably will be. Uh, and I think it makes sense just given the every down roll and especially compared to last week. Now, maybe not on the season. Josh Dobbs... Apparently, it's the man, dude. What a fun story that was. Uh, sorry to your Falcons. But, All right, but, we're used to it. Uh, Clayton Toon, obviously, not an NFL starting quarterback. So if he gets a quarterback upgrade here, the price comes down a little bit. Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense if you do want to go back to Trey McBride this week, assuming Kyler is in. I went to a Falcons and Cardinals game because that's the matchup this week. I went to that game, Kyler's rookie year. I went to the game with Brooks and Jason. And my Falcons were there. And that was still like in like Matt Ryan, Julio days. So it was like, oh, we're going to destroy them. Kyle was a rookie. We went to Arizona and freaking lost to that team. So, you know, I, at first I looked at the line and I asked Betts like, why are the Falcons not favored by more? The Cardinals stink. It's like if Kyler returns, there's a real chance that the Cardinals win at home against the Falcons and Taylor Heineke. It's, it's, uh, it's on the table, which you have the Cardinals down as a defense that you could play this week. Yeah, the defense options are not great. Last week, it felt like you had 
Like I had like six below 3K that I was excited to play. This week, man, it's really tough. So if you're trying to save you know, as much money as possible and still find someone that will play and project okay, I think the Cardinals are in play at 2.5, just taking on the combo of Taylor Heineke and Arthur Smith. The Texans are a pun option that maybe you're like, I don't really want to go there. We don't know exactly what Jamar Chase. It seems like he has a back issue that might not be a thing, but if he's out, that's at least interesting. They're super cheap on FanDuel at 3.2. Another cheap defense is the Jaguars. If you wanted to punt, they're at home. Mention them against the 49ers, 2.4. I just, I don't love going in the 3K range in cash. And even when you get up there, it's like the Vikings at 3.2. No, thank you. Um, the Browns on the road against Lamar. That could be interesting in tournaments because Lamar sometimes is not too careful with the football. But I don't know, like any any expensive options you're going to pay for? I don't think so. I mean, I think we're going to get questions about the Cowboys at <laughs> 4.4. That's just so tough to fit. This actually feels a lot like, do you remember, was it last year or the year before they played the Texans? And it was this scenario. They were at home. They were favored by like, 17 points or something and everyone was like you gotta play him in cash right the texans actually hung around and were okay in that game they stayed right. pretty close so not saying that's gonna happen because i don't think it will but um i'm hesitant to pay up for the cowboys i know we're gonna get some questions on that i am going to do a little study and report back on this podcast on friday but i'm gonna look up every single defense that has been priced at 4k or above and just to see what do they do and, you know, I can look at the spreads too, but it's like, did any of those teams really matter? In cash, I don't care at all. And, you know, if people are going to play the Cowboys, like, that's fine. You are, you know, giving up $2,000 between the Jaguars and the Cowboys. Like, I am not doing that for a defense. In tournaments, like, we can talk about it uh, and we'll talk about the roster percentage, but has it worked out? I don't know the answer to that question, but I will do the research and report back to you. And because I said it on this podcast, I hopefully I will do it. You have to. It's a, it, you're, new, you're now contractually obligated, Kyle. I feel like, would you consider me like a man of my word, like following through on this podcast? No, I would not. Okay, good. Because last no. year, no. we made a wager. No. And you still haven't paid it out. And this year, we made a wager uh, that was a water bet. It's a very simple bet to what pay What was out. it again? I don't even remember. It was, you, it was DraftKings points, Jarek McKinnon versus, I think, Kadarius Tony. So you are really, on the McKinnon side. What a dumb bet that was by me. I know. But no, you haven't paid out any of those. So you're you're that guy. Gosh, I'm usually not that guy. Okay, you know what? I hear you. This is this is my wake up <laughs> moment. You know, this is I'm gonna I'm gonna start working out. I'm gonna get a Bowflex, you know? <laughs> this is Please buy can you still buy a Bowflex? I'm sure you can. I, I'm I mean on Craigslist. Yeah, maybe maybe you need to get a knockoff one. If you want to play with us, go to BallersDFS.com. We'll direct you to our DraftKings League, Fantasy Footballers DFS Borg, and Bets. You can enter the contest. I'm at a contest right now. So if you want to come take my money, come do it, BallersDFS.com. And that'll do it for us. Bets, sign us off. Yes, sir. Week 10 is here. We are back on Friday to break it down in more detail, in which Kyle will certainly not live up to his bet. So we won't get any information on the 4K defenses. Thanks, Kyle. Hope you guys have a great week. We'll catch you on Friday. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Fantasy Footballers DFS and Betting Podcast. Don't forget to visit us on the web at thefantasyfootballers.com.